I did a seminar on Vermeer, and one of the topics was Vermeer and cartography. Well, like you, I've always loved maps. I thought, this is, this is made for me. But I do remember coming back to Boston and giving a lecture, probably to a similar audience. <clears throat> well, not, no, not a similar audience. But I'll never forget um, a woman coming up to me afterwards, and first of all, probably saying, where are you from? And I would say, Iowa, as we do. And she said, oh, we pronounce that Ohio out here. And then when, you, <laughs> then when you say that, you say, no, I mean Iowa. Are you sure you don't mean Idaho? You know, you just give up then. In any case, we know it now because we have the caucuses. But it was a Bostonian like that who said to me, and what was your dissertation topic? I mean, how many times do you get asked that at a cocktail party? It had to be a New Englander. And I said, Vermeer and cartography. <gasps> oh, she had a big sigh. She said, oh, don't tell me he had heart trouble now. <clears throat> Tonight we're going to talk about Vermeer and his love of maps, which I know you have as well. I'm going to take you to the wonderful town of Delft, uh, where Vermeer spent his whole life, 1632 to 1675, not a long life. <clears throat> and this is the, the great painting in the Maurits House, which uh, became the mecca for the Impressionists in the 19th century to go see, particularly how he captured light, this very luminous quality, which you'll see in a lot of his other paintings as well. This was the golden age of Holland, the Netherlands. This was the time, in a way, a forerunner of America, where people came from all over the world for economic uh, freedom, for uh, religious uh, freedom, all these great opportunities, and a real melting pot. In fact, Holland had so little to offer, so it shows you the talents coming together made it. The word Holland comes from the uh, Dutch word Houtland, which means woodland, and there were no trees there when most people came in the 17th century. Most of them were cut down to make those masts for the ships that we know sailed the Dutch around the world. <clears throat> in any case, it was a golden age of painting as well. And this is where, for the first time, the chief client of the artists were people like you and me, no longer the church and the state. Calvinism was the dominant religion, but it was the people who were becoming very wealthy through all these new industries, etc., in the Netherlands. And they wanted works that they could relate to. And often they were religious subjects or historical or mytho mythological themes. But what became very popular were scenes of everyday life, which we call genre scenes. And that's what Vermeer became a master at, capturing these moments in our everyday life in such a beautiful way. Uh, he really made it a perfect world. And I think one thing you'll see <clears throat> and when we study the maps in his paintings, how much he edited his works. It isn't just as he saw it. He would uh, craft them very carefully. He also used very expensive pigments. He wasn't, it appears, painting for the open market like, like a lot of artists were doing. He seems to have had his clients that he could have spent many, many, many hours on one individual painting. And these are the kinds of paintings he did of the working class, the wonderful Milkmaid, uh, the, the painting that is in the Rijksmuseum, becomes sort of a symbol of Holland. And he's edited this so carefully that you just almost can hear the trickle of milk coming out of the, the picture there. All of your attention goes on to the focus, which is the focus of that young woman there, so carefully crafted. Or the same thing in this great painting from the Louvre of the, um, the lace maker. <clears throat> and he does not give us a literal image. In fact, I almost hate to tell you, but he has exaggerated the head of that woman. Her hair is, head is going up to get a more beautiful design. Think about it. It doesn't really make sense three-dimensionally, but two-dimensionally it does work well. And uh, this is the crafting of his works. And I should point out right from the get-go that many of these works are rather small, some only this big. Well, <clears throat> Vermeer died in 1675, as I mentioned, and from there, from then on, till the middle of the 19th century, few people knew of him. You do find his name in uh, auctions uh, when his works are being sold, but he was not the household name he is today. The person who first put him on the map for modern times is Tori Berger, this uh, art historian, Frenchman in Paris, who started collecting his works. He owned those three works that you see on the screen next to a photograph of him. And um, he published the articles that really made the 
world look at these works? Now, there are not many works by Vermeer. When he was first published in the 19th century, they thought they would find many, many more. Some of you are probably aware of the Van Megaren scandal, where um, Van Megaren uh, imitated Vermeer, was caught during World War II. Uh, so uh, some have come to light, uh, but not any in recent times. In fact, there are only about 34 paintings by Vermeer. Now, probably the beauty of him being discovered late is that a major portion of those are in America. Uh, that's, <clears throat> that's because the Americans had the money during this great industrial boom when we were creating our great collections, our museums, etc. And we have about a little over a third of those works to look at. Of course, there was one in Boston which sadly was stolen, has not been retrieved yet, the concert when it was taken away from the Gardner Museum in 1990. But today, Vermeer is clearly a rock star. I mean, everyone knows Vermeer like they know Vincent van Gogh. And he's in books, he's on the big screen. Some of you have probably uh, read the book, The Girl with the Pearl Earring, although we now wonder if it's really pearl or if it is pewter. Art historians love to uh, upset the apple cart. <clears throat> in any case, uh, Tracy Valier did a, a great job, I think, of researching the, um, the Delft in the 17th century. I think Vermeer came off a little bit like a wuss, but anyway, um, really took you back to that wonderful golden age. Vermeer has since been studied from many different perspectives. For example, the musical instruments, which are so well defined in his paintings, whether it's a clavichord, a guitar, or you name it. Um, he's been studied from the standpoint of religion. He was uh, baptized in the um, Reform, uh, Dutch Reformed Church, but he did become Catholic when he married a woman from the Utrecht area, which was the Catholic town, and um, apparently was um, quite loyal to the Catholic religion. We'll look at this painting more in depth later on. <clears throat> As I said, these paintings are relatively small. The ones you're seeing here are only about this big, beautifully crafted, and many of them seem to have been depict, uh, shall I say, painted in the same room. And art historians have studied um, what they think is the room, uh, you can see these perspectival drawings <clears throat> of a painting that we're going to look at in more detail because it does have a great map in it. You can see the um, drawing to the right where you have an overview of it and then a side angle. And this is quite important, as you'll see later, because it shows you very clearly that the map, which seems to be right over the head of the girl or the young woman, is actually about the same distance as that woman is from the man. This is an early work by Vermeer. And... Um, he seems to still be finding his way. In fact, before I did my research, some people identified uh, that map as a, an atlas map, and you'll see it's much bigger than that. Another area that's gotten a lot of attention of late is the, <clears throat> uh, I should say, optical effects that we see in Vermeer's paintings. Take, for example, this really small painting at the National Gallery in, Lund in uh, Washington, D.C., if you look, for example, the, at the highlights on her pearl earrings, or even her lips, or the uh, finials of the chair, these are highlights that you might associate with photography. And so the, <clears throat> there is this um, thought that did Vermeer actually use the forerunner of the modern camera, the camera obscura, which literally means dark room, where if you go into a dark room, you put a hole in the wall, what is outside will be reflected upside down on the back wall. And of course, if you start introducing lenses, you get a sharper image. And we know that they were working with lenses. Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, who invented the microscope, was a close friend of Vermeer. They're actually, they're born in the same year. Their, their name is entered in the, in the church um, document on the same page. A person who's really run with this is Tim Jennison. You may know him from the full-length feature movie, Tim's Vermeer, where he uh, made a copy, shall we say, of the painting on the left, which is in the Queen's collection in England. And Tim Jennison would be the first to say he is not an artist. He was a software engineer who, became, who made a fortune and had so much money that he could literally create a studio in Texas, um, create the musical instrument in this painting, all of the things, and set it up like Vermeer would have seen it, and then had people pose. And over a year, 
uh, created this painting uh, using not necessarily a camera obscura, but a mirror device. Uh, and I'm um, showing how Vermeer got these luminous effects. This is still up for a lot of debate, but here you can see his work compared to the painting uh, in the Buckingham Palace. <clears throat> in any case, uh, Vermeer was certainly aware of the camera obscura. One of my colleagues who is at the National Gallery, who has been there for a long time and did one of the big Vermeer shows, Arthur Wheelock, when I was at BU, he was at Harvard working on the Delft and the optics, use of optics, and he would probably say that they were probably more imitating the effects they saw through the camera obscura. In fact, it'd be very hard to get into a dark box and paint a picture. Not only would you have to stand on your head, but <clears throat> the colors wouldn't match when you took them out into natural daylight. Anyway, a lot to think about there. And of course, the maps. I'll never forget the, when I was at Boston University, Susan Koretsky, who was my professor there, who's uh, still at Vassar College, her uh, alma mater, uh, I did a seminar on Vermeer with her, and one of the topics was Vermeer and cartography. Well, like you, I've always loved maps. I thought, this is, this is made for me. <clears throat> and um, I took it, and then I uh, had the opportunity to go to Holland for a week after that semester and found one of the maps in his paintings and thought, if I can do that in a week, what I could do in a year, and then got a, uh, <clears throat> a Crest Fellowship to do that. Um, but I do remember coming back to Boston and giving a lecture, probably to a similar audience. <clears throat> well, not, no, not a similar audience. But I'll never forget um, a woman coming up to me afterwards and, first of all, probably saying, where are you from? And I would say, Iowa, as we do. And she said, oh, we pronounce that Ohio out here. And then when you, <laughs> then when you say that, you say, no, I mean Iowa. Are you sure you don't mean Idaho? You know, you just give up then. In any case, we know it now because we have the caucuses, but it was a Bostonian like that who said to me, and what was your dissertation topic? I mean, how many times do you get asked that at a cocktail party? It had to be a New Englander. And I said, Vermeer and cartography. <gasps> oh, she had a big sigh. She said, oh, don't tell me he had heart trouble now. <clears throat> <clears throat> anyway. It was actually Tory Berger who was the first to comment on what he called Vermeer's mania for maps. And maps do appear in about a third of his works of art. And all of these maps and pictures coincide with the great age of Dutch map making. I know you're well aware of that. It was an amazing time for the Dutch who were literally charting the world it's just incredible to think about going out on these ships, not knowing if you're ever going to get back, going way around the world. I think the only thing that we can equate it with is probably what we're doing in outer space. And I don't think we're aware of what we're doing out there. You know, zillions of miles away, we collect some of that photography at the Worcester Art Museum. And when our curator tells me the number of light years or whatever, I just want to go home and take a nap. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Well, somewhat similar in 17th century Holland, <clears throat> their ships were all around the world, bringing back information that made these great maps that <clears throat> we um, see the map makers um, using here. <clears throat> and of course, Amsterdam became a major city for the production of maps. Now, a lot of this information was under lock and key. As some of you know, they talk about discovering a river in Africa in the 18th century, and we know that the Dutch knew about it in the 17th century. It was on one of the Dutch East India maps, but it was under uh, lock and key. Um, they were everywhere around the world. Here, for example, you can see um, in Indonesia, uh, Batavia, these great colonies which the Dutch had, or up into the Arctic. And these are these great paintings that would be done at the same time, bringing the world home this wonderful aerial view of Amsterdam is like a map. I mean, you'd think they had airplanes back then, but they didn't. Uh, in fact, they couldn't build tall buildings in Holland because much of the land is reclaimed from the sea. And it was the, when the city hall was built in the 17th century, it was called the eighth wonder of the world. It was amazing. But they could only do that by putting a lot of pilings underneath, sort of like Boston, actually. And I like to show you this aerial view of Holland, of, of Amsterdam, not only because so many of the maps were produced there, but also 
because so much of that land was reclaimed from the sea. And that's important because that contributes to maps being getting out of date very quickly, just as the information coming from around the world. Adding new information, maps get outdated quickly, and that's something we'll focus on when we're looking at Vermeer's maps. Well, one of the areas that I've done a lot of work on is, world, is wall maps. And very sadly, there are very few that remain today. Some estimates, maybe only well over 50, um, well-preserved. And most of them are not preserved well. This is one that um, I located uh, in a, the uh, Sacramento Library in California, um, and only one edition at the time known, Peter Van de Keer's wall map of 1611. And a talk that I've given uh, some time ago is, in many ways, these are like the World Wide Web that we know today. Because if you go back and look at them, you have the world there, but you have all these windows all around the map taking you into different countries, showing you the people, showing you their capital cities, etc. Uh, a great resource. Almost like a, maybe when we were growing up, a, a set of a home set of encyclopedia, encyclopedia. But of course, we now have our computers and our internet that bring the world um, to our desktop. <clears throat> as I mentioned, Vermeer capitalized on map making as a subject in his paintings. Uh, he wasn't the only one to use maps. They appear in many uh, Dutch uh, pictures. In fact, I, that was my dissertation to focus on all the map makers, all the painters who use maps in their paintings. But no one, no one does them as detailed and as specifically as Vermeer. Well, let's start with <clears throat> one of his earliest paintings. It's a painting that many of you probably have seen at the Frick Collection in New York, The Officer and the Laughing Girl, an early work. And there you see on the back wall this uh, large map that looks rather small because it seems to be closer to the woman in front of it. You could identify this map by just looking at his painting because there's a Latin inscription that close up you can read, and it says, new and accurate map of Holland and West Friesland. <clears throat> but many people today might not recognize Holland and West Friesland. Why do you think? North is not at the top. North is to the right. North um, at the top is, after all, only a convention. If map making would have taken off in Australia, we'd be looking at the, ourselves from the bottom up. Yeah, hard to think that. <clears throat> but uh, in any case, um, they put these maps in more of an artistic way, in a way, or how it made sense to put the land formation. And for the Dutch, the North Sea would be at the top. That would be at the top if you were doing a landscape, for example. The, wa the ocean would be at the top of the painting if you look out to the North Sea. Let's look at that map closer. Well, there it is. And you can see all the ships and the seas on which they sail, the names are given there. And here's the original map. You can see it's very accurate. In fact, the only map that we know of that exists, and this is the case with most of the painting, the maps in Vermeer's paintings, maybe only one, two or three, but not more original survive. There's only one that survives today that was put together. It's in a museum in North Holland in Horn, the museum there. And it's in not great condition, as you can imagine. It's faded. <clears throat> um, there's little holes in it where I think silverfish have eaten part of the paper, etc. Just imagine if you had a wall map in your grade school. It probably doesn't exist today, whereas atlas maps are much better preserved. Well, you here can bring that diagram back, and you can see that it is much further back on the back wall. Now let's look at the map close up because this is made up of many different sheets. The central part is from engraved copper plates. Okay? How many do you think make up that central part of the map? Quite a shot. 22 engraved plates, and they're about this big. Yeah. So you can imagine if a map maker is going to put that much effort into engraving these copper plates, he's going to produce lots of wall maps to get his money back, his return. Right. And you will see as we go on, many of these copper plates got in the hands of other map makers later on and got updated. Not always geographically, actually more often decoratively, 
which also will tell us something. <clears throat> and then this map includes um, text on three sides, Dutch, French, and Latin, and that's um, uh, printed um, on paper as well. So <clears throat> these um, different sheets of paper would be mounted to a canvas, glued on, and then uh, hand-colored, and then varnish, okay? And often put on rollers, and the reason for rollers, you could roll them up, but also the rollers would um, keep it away from the wall, so humidity in that would not be so much a factor. Is there anything else you might, as map people, notice about that wall map? It's something that I commented on early on in the 70s, but no one had ever thought about it, and it just amazed me. The land is blue. I don't think ever does the map maker use blue for the, always for the water, not for the land. Well, it wasn't originally blue. It was probably green. And Vermeer used um, a blue and then put a yellow um, layer over it to make green. But over time, that yellow uh, that he used was rather fugitive. And we see this in a lot of Dutch paintings. We see it in one of Vermeer's two outdoor scenes. For example, the little street in the Rijksmuseum. If you look at the foliage there, you can see that it's turned blue. It was originally green. We call that blue sickness. You see it in a lot of still lifes from 17th century Holland. <clears throat> well, Vermeer used this map another time in this painting at the Rijksmuseum. And you can see here, the map looks entirely different. In fact, you may not think it's the same map, but trust me, it is. <laughs> I've scrutinized that painting, and you can even see little wrinkles and folds that he captures uh, on that the, the paper surface that correspond with the other painting. Let's bring the map back. And one of the reasons it looks somewhat different is it's a, only about half of the map is showing. But he's orchestrated it in such a way that it's now reduced to ochre tones that complements his blue and yellow scheme that is so popular in many of his paintings, just like this rectilinear design is so <clears throat> such a favorite of Vermeer. It's this map that he used a third time. Can you find it? It's off to the left there. Here you see it. You're seeing the lower right portion. Actually, it's on a stained wall. You can see the stains coming down. <clears throat> and here you have a woman not reading a letter, but about to, receiving a letter, under uh, a landscape and a seascape. Now, one questions, did Vermeer own this map? Because if you think about it, it's in one of his earliest works, about 1657. It's in this painting from mid-career, and this one toward the end of his career. Well, in fact, we don't know if he owned it or if he borrowed it. If there is an inventory done of Vermeer's estate when he died in 1675. It doesn't mention any maps, no cartographic material. But it does mention a lot of paintings by other artists as well, because he, was, he ran an art shop. And here, to, bring, to show you a small sketch, by Jan de Braai, a Harlem painter. You can see <clears throat> in this shop, which is something you, like you might find in Sturbridge Village today, where they sold everything, a general store. You can see they're looking at paintings on the wall. Um, they're selling everything from fabric to you name it. And up on the back, you see cartographic material. So Vermeer could have bought and sold maps. Another map of the Netherlands, that, and this is the first one that I was able to discover um, so many years ago now. Uh, this is a painting in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. I still remember seeing this in a, one of my readers in grade school, and I loved Dutch painting then, I guess, but I always wondered, wonder if that map could be identified. It looks so real, so specific. Well, it is a real map, and here it is, and it's the Netherlands. It's the north and the south. Um, this is um, showing north to the right, and of course, the Netherlands is a very interesting country at this time because the southern Netherlands, by the end of the 16th century, um, remained loyal to Spain, Catholic, whereas the north, through the Eighty Years' War, broke away and became Protestant and became the new Dutch Republic, the seven provinces versus the ten provinces from the south. <clears throat> now here's where we get to see, and you can see how specific it is. You can identify the map mainly by the cartouches. But... If you look there, um, if you look closely, you have what we call in art history some pentimenti. The singular is pentimento. It comes from the Italian word pentire, which means 
to repent or change your mind. It's basically when an artist covers up an original, an earlier design because he wants to improve the painting. Art historians love discovering pentamenti because it usually means, not absolutely sure, but usually means you're not looking at a copy, but you're looking at the original. Well, what happens is that those underdesigns, because paint becomes more transparent over the years, sometimes those underdesigns come through and you can see them without using x-ray or infrared photography. And there are a couple pentamenti in this painting. Can you find them? I'll help you out. I've outlined them in white. You can see the map was originally behind the woman's head. And there was a chair in the foreground. Think about it. And here I'll, I'll show you a, um, a modern uh, version. Someone did a black and white illustration working from that x-ray and everything. Um, can you imagine doing all that detail on the map and then moving it? He was rather anal. Yeah, you're not about to do that, right? <laughs> yeah, you'd leave it as it is. But you would not have the powerful picture that he has. Look at that, how he edited that. It's so powerful. This is that beautiful world, the world in which, yes, there's a woman, but the real protagonist is the light in the painting. And we know that Vermeer was using very expensive pigments. <clears throat> On that back wall, he was using lapis lazuli, <clears throat> which is an ultramarine blue that comes from Afghanistan. Can you imagine the cost of getting it up to North Holland? <clears throat> it's rarely used in paintings, and usually in religious paintings, only for the Madonna, because she's so special. But he obviously had clients or was uh, redoing these works on retainer. Yeah. Well, Vermeer is not the only one to use this map. You see it in this painting by Peter de Hoek, another Delft painter, a contemporary of Vermeer, who went off to Amsterdam to work. <clears throat> you see it on the back wall there. Um, here you see it. Uh, a little differently in that it has a little text underneath it there. Sort of hard probably to make out in the slide. But this is an interesting map to discuss because it was first um, published by Jodocus Hondius um, in um, 1630. And then the copper plates were taken over by another map maker, Hauk Allert, and reissued the map, who reissued it again in 1671. Now, if you could see all the geography in great detail, you would discover that there were no changes in the geography. And there should have been, because there were poldering that was going on at that time. Uh, but there is a change in the ornamentation. And the major change is the main cartouche. <clears throat> you can see in Hondius's map, it's a mannerist design. It's an old-fashioned design. It's a really a style of the 16th century. One wonders if he didn't get the plates from someone earlier, even. And Hauk Allert updates it and puts a much more Baroque-style design um, more nationalistic and uh, more naturalistic. That's interesting and something I'm paying more attention to because, as you will see, many of these maps that Vermeer uses date much earlier in the 17th century, which invites us to think about why is he using these maps? Why do we use maps? We use them for decoration a lot too, right? Well, let's, we'll get into that. <clears throat> Vermeer used uh, other subjects besides the Netherlands. I think this is very obvious to you. It's a, a map of Europe. This is a painting in the Metropolitan Museum uh, in New York, the lute player, the woman with a lute. And um, it's a great wall map that um, was um, first published by Jodocus Hondius in 1613. And then Johan Blau took it over, reissued the map again, and the only thing he did was change his name. The, and, of course, the date is now 1659, long time in between. Now, Vermeer's painting is very detailed, but even in Vermeer's painting, we can't see the name of the author here. Otherwise, we could say which edition it is. There you see the, the map, and this is one of the remaining examples. You can see it's not in great condition. The first time I saw the original map um, of this was um, at the... British Museum, there were three great atlases were put together in the 17th century as political gifts, and one went to uh, the King of England, uh, and they were made up of wall maps, so it's a huge book, and I remember the pleasure I had when they r rolled it out on a big uh, wheeler and then opened it one page at a time, and I was able to see this 
um, map of Europe. Since then, other editions have been found. Well, the most ambitious map uh, that appears in Vermeer's painting happily appears in his most ambitious composition and a, a work that's been written about a lot. This, um, maybe some of you have seen it. How many have seen this? This is in the Quintus Storch Museum in Vienna. Uh, it was uh, confiscated by Hitler. The Nazis put it into salt mines. Uh, it survived, and it's just one of the great treasures of the 17th century. Um, let's look at the map. This map had been identified before I started working on it, and it was identified um, the central part only, which you can see here. Um, it's a map of the Netherlands, I think you're getting to know the country, with north to the top, uh, north to the right, west at the top. <clears throat> and um, it's made into a very elaborate wall map with all this decoration on the side. And we do know that there were catalogs at this time saying that you can get a map made up in any way you want. Do you want a French text, Latin text, Dutch text? Do you want side views? Do you want horses on the top, you want, you know, royal figures, you name it. Vermeer was not the only Dutch painter to feature this map in his paintings. It appears in three paintings um, by Jakob Achtervelt, and I'm very grateful for the fact that Achtervelt used maps in his paintings because this was the dissertation, he was the dissertation of my mentor, Susan Koretsky, and that's why she put maps in that Vermeer seminar, because she was fascinated by the maps, and because of them in um, Jakob Achtervelt. But you can see in his paintings, it's just this, the simple version of that map. Sometimes with the text, in these cases, it, it's a framed map, but not the elaborate um, uh, that you see. Here you can see better the map. But let's go back to Vermeer's painting, and we're going to reconstruct this map. In fact, it um, says something about Vermeer's detail, that through his um, painting, I'm able to reconstruct a lost wall map, a map that doesn't exist in its entirety anymore. In any case, um, I did do research and put that all together, and then my colleague in Holland, some of you may know, Gunter Schilder, who's done tremendous work in Holland, the great specialist on Dutch cartography, many years later he found, I couldn't, I, I remember so well when he, probably didn't email me then, but sent me a letter, I found a version of that map in a, uh, in Skull Cluster, Sweden, in a, um, in a drawer. I'm going to show it to you. One, to show you how much these maps have suffered. There you see a black and white photograph of it. It's in, it's in pieces there at the bottom. <clears throat> what I couldn't wait to see is the town views. But wouldn't you know, um, it included only 10 on one side. It doesn't include 10 on the other side. It does, of course, also include men on horseback at the top, so it's more elaborate in that sense. That map has since been restored, you can see it here. But thanks to research, it was able to put together all the town views on the side, thanks to the detail of Vermeer's painting. <clears throat> Let's look at that central part more closely, because, rather fascinating, um, it's made up of nine copper, or nine sheets uh, in uh, printed from a copper plate. We're going to focus on this one. It was just my pure luck when I was doing research one day at the um, the uh, University of Amsterdam Library in their map room, and I came across the map, the sheet on the left, which is the only sheet we know of from the original version of this map. And it's by the Jan van Deutekam. And look at the date, 1594. Now, Klaus Janssen Fischer takes over those copper plates and produces a map, we think about 1630, okay? Um, and the interesting thing is that the only difference between the sheet on the left and the one on the right is the cartouche. No changes in the topography, yeah. And you'll see that the cartouche on the right is much more nationalistic with its lion or Leo Belgicus, the symbol of all the seven provinces, and um, naturalistic, whereas you get all that strap work, much more mannerist in design. Now, this would not affect us so much, because we'd say they're both good-looking, but the work on the left would have been considered very old-fashioned by the 1630s. Think about if you were living with um, material 
um, that your grandparents had on their walls. You'd probably want to update it a little bit. If it's an old master painting, you would keep it, I'm sure. In any case, um, we're going to look at another cartouche, and it's up at the upper left corner. Look at it in detail here, because it tells you a lot about map making in the 17th century. It was both a science and an art. <clears throat> you can see the science part represented by the woman holding a measuring stick, a compass, etc. And then on the right, you see a woman with a palette, a painter's palette, a mall stick uh, to steady her hand, and then also a sheet with a town view on it. Not so different from the town views you see on the sides of the map. So it is so wonderful that in Vermeer's most complex and one of his largest paintings, that he preserved for us this great map from the 17th century. Well, this map might have been featured in another painting, we think, and that is this painting. You don't see it today, but it probably was in there originally. And x-rays show, as we can see on the left here, there was a map behind that woman. And even in spite of all the detail that went into it, he painted it out. Again, the maps tell us a lot about his editing. Um, and here I'll bring back that map here. You can see, I think, make out a little bit the town views on the left or bring back the reconstruction that I made, you can see it there. Um, here again, if you look at the painting, you can see he not only got rid of the map, but he also got rid of the musical instrument on the chair. This is the beauty of Vermeer. I always remember one of my teachers said, if I had more time, I'd write you a shorter letter. Editing, editing, reduction, reduction, you, that's where you get to the beauty. As I tell my students, writing is difficult, but it's only the right word in the right place. <laughs> yeah, don't use so many words. Vermeer, that's the beauty of his paintings. <clears throat> well, one might wonder about the maps in his paintings. Are they more than just decoration? Um, we do know that many art historians have talked about, not just Vermeer, but uh, documented that many of the background objects are symbolic in these paintings. Take, for example, this painting by Vermeer in the National Gallery in DC, there's a woman holding a balance, and immediately behind her is a <clears throat> painting of the Last Judgment. I think anyone could make the connection between the two here, that um, he's making a comment on the idea of justice and also temperance. <clears throat> the Dutch used paintings to teach. Uh, Calvinism permeates these paintings. They suck you in with a very secular subject, and it might be a subject like a bordello or a whorehouse, and they'll teach you about moderation in all things. <laughs> um, this is how they worked. In any case, um, we might want to look at the paintings of Vermeer's with his maps to see whether the paintings are symbolic. Well, first of all, what is this painting all about? Um, it's not a portrait of Vermeer in a studio. It's an allegorical painting somewhat suggested by the, the drapery pulled back, is revealing actually something from the past. And the, the costume that the painter is wearing is Burgundian. It's from the 16th century. In fact, when I finally got to Vienna to see this painting, I noticed something that people had not commented on, that the, the blacks are two different colors uh, in his dress. And you can probably detect that in the slide. But he's just cobbled together here a costume which for him is from the earlier days. The woman in front of the map is no ordinary woman. She's an allegorical figure. She is Cleo, the muse of history. <clears throat> and that's why she's holding a trumpet and holding the book of Thucydides, the father of history. And a nice little detail here is that she's wearing a crown of laurel leaves. Why laurel? because laurel always remains green, right? People who are, should be famous should be famous forever in history. And I wish we did know history better uh, today than, we, than um, some people do. But the irony of it here is that the, blue, the leaves are now blue. It's a good example, again, of that blue sickness where they were originally green, but the yellow has disappeared. <clears throat> well, what about the map in the painting? Is it symbolic? I think it is. I think, and most art historians have interpreted the painting as, this is the artist um, looking at history, and it's through history that we are able to capture the ideal. You know, it's like Monday morning quarterbacking. 
It's when you step back, you see what's really important in history, right? Yeah. Um, don't send that email immediately. Think it over. <laughs> Look at it even one minute later. You might want to edit it. In any case, this is the concept behind this painting. Well, the map is perfect because the map is a map of the 17 provinces, <clears throat> which gradually divided during the late 16th and 17th century. One of the bloodiest wars in the history of mankind, the 80 Years' War, um, already by the early 17th century, the Dutch at the, um, were considered independent from Spain, but it really wasn't concluded until 1648 with the Treaty of Münster. And a little detail that I think is probably not by accident, knowing how careful Vermeer is, that there's a crack in that map, as you can see, <clears throat> and it happens to go right down the middle of that map, going right through the town of Breda, which is one of the strategic um, <clears throat> uh, cities during the Eighty Years' War separating the north from the south. Well, there's one map, or one painting, in Vermeer's <coughs> um, paintings that we know was used allegorically. And this is an, an allegory somewhat similar to the one we've just looked at with a curtain separating it from us. It's called The Allegory of Faith. It's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And I know the next time you go there, you're going to scrutinize that globe, as I have. Uh, and Vermeer here, who was Catholic at this time, um, basically followed a recipe book. And these books that painters use would tell you how to depict an allegorical figure. And in this book by Cesare Ripa, it says if you're going to depict the figure of faith, she should have her foot on the earth. Well, for Vermeer, it would be none other than a tr real terrestrial globe, right? And I'm going to show you that. Close up the globe. And a real globe by Yodokas Hondias, photographed at the same angle, which is important. Now, you're going to have to bear with me, but this just shows you some of the detail in Vermeer's work. <clears throat> this globe was published in three editions. First in 1600, and then in 1617, the Dutch discovered the coastline of Australia and put that on this globe and other maps as well. And then in 1627, Prince Maurits of, of Orange passed away, and that large cartouche, which is right in the center there, was removed from the globe because he was deceased. Well, we can date this globe specifically because if you look closely, and don't get too close, the guard will probably chase you away from this painting, but um, you can see the coastline of Australia in Vermeer's painting. Yeah, it's that detail. Yeah. And that's nice because now we have more evidence that he's using older, older cartographic material. And as I said, the cartouche <clears throat> was removed. Does he put that up front for us because it's a symbol of transitoriness of life? You know, one of the most common theme in Dutch painting is the passing of life, a venitas, if you will, that even if you're the head of the country, you will die someday. Uh, sort of a memento mori kind of symbol. Also, Vermeer puts the foot of faith on Asia, which at that time was considered outside the Christian world. Yeah. Okay, well, if the globe is maybe is, is symbolic, what about the other maps? It's more difficult to come up with a real answer. I spent a lot of time writing on this, but um, let's think about this one. You've got a, a map on the back wall, of this couple um, enjoying each other in this light-filled room. We know that that map appeared in two other paintings, one reading a letter, receiving a letter. Um, what about these maps? One woman looking out the window, another woman looking out the window with another a watering pitcher, but also a musical instrument. <clears throat> well, they may relate to a very common theme in Dutch art, one that dates back to the Middle Ages, um, very popular among D uh, Dutch and German artists, called Frau Welt, or Lady World. And um, this print, which comes with a, a large text, I'm only showing you the print, which explains this particular print. I'm, I'm not making this stuff up. Um, you can see there's a, a young man grasping the arm of the woman, and she's um, got a lot of cleavage. <laughs> she um, also has a globe on her head, or an orb, and she represents the world. <clears throat> I'm sorry for women, but they're always the evil people in these older paintings. 
Hopefully that's going to change. Um, but they're seducing this man. And then if you look in the background, and the text talks about this, you got the old man saying, young man, be careful of worldly pleasures. In fact, you don't even, you're not even grasping the woman, you're grasping her bracelet. <laughs> He's being pretty technical, I would say. Well, does the map on the back wall represent worldliness here? Is this woman a prostitute? She could well be. She has her hand out. Maybe she's asking for money. We know of many, many paintings from 17th century Holland of bordellos. Come to the Worcester Art Museum. We have a great Dutch collection. We have a couple of them out there. Um, so that could be the case. Um, here's a, a good example by another painter, Jan Mies Molinar. Um, this is a painting at the Toledo Museum in Ohio. And <clears throat> clearly, this is Lady World. You can see that she has her foot on a skull. Uh, she's looking in a mirror, she's holding a ring, and then particularly important in front of her is a boy blowing bubbles. Bubbles are here today, are one second and gone the, the next. And there's all these elements of worldliness. Now I know that you people would be noticing on the back wall a map, but notice how it's positioned such that the Western Hemisphere appears right above her head. And this is an, an original map. It's by Jan Jansonius, a world map that I've been able to identify. In any case, um, what about this painting? The map was painted out, but it is clearly a vanitas picture. Um, the woman is looking into a mirror, holding a pearl earring or a pearl necklace. It's all about this theme, but Vermeer has edited down so much that we have to know that, but in the 17th century, they would know that this is a picture of Vanitas. Well, we do know that Vermeer must have had the opportunity to observe map makers um, making these maps. In fact, um, this painting, which is in Frankfurt, uh, is a beautiful illustration of a, a man surrounded by cartographic material. In his study, uh, in his workshop, probably the same room that was used for those other works, in this case, he's staging these um, people and objects and props. But what's important is the man is looking out the window and capturing that world on paper, bringing the world home. And if you look on the back wall, you'll see there's a framed map. Uh, it is a postcard, as they're called. Here you can see. The best one I can connect with it is by Blau. And um, here you see it framed up. I'm going to bring a, a detail of it. <clears throat> these are often uh, printed on parchment, and the reason I think is that they were often taken to sea um, because they were designed to be used at sea. You can see, again, West is um, at the top, and you could probably make out Spain and France and Italy, and the only thing that's really recorded on this map are all the coastal towns, and then all those rum lines that enabled people to navigate, the, navigate themselves around the the Atlantic and the uh, Baltic and the Mediterranean world. Well, we do know from um, these catalogs that they promoted these maps for um, framing and hanging up in your home. And you can see, if you look closely, this has tacking edges all around it. So it would be probably like the one in Vermeer's painting with a black frame around it. You'll notice on the back wall there's a terrestrial globe. No surprise, it's the same terrestrial globe that we saw in the Allegory of Faith. But now you can see it's not with um, the Cartouche's tortoise, and it's, not, it's now in a, a stand treated like a scientific instrument. And interesting enough, uh, you have um, the um, East Indies um, facing us. Very important to the Dutch with their East Indies companies. Well, another painting by Vermeer that we're quite sure were pendants uh, when they were painted. They may not look the same because the geographer, and I know many of you saw this recently because it was uh, at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts for the Class Distinction Show uh, on loan from the, um, the Louvre. Uh, I first saw it in the Rothschild collection in Paris. I will never forget that because I had to go there to see the original, of course. I was graciously welcomed into this home. I remember my Dutch family who I was living with said, do you know that Rothschild is like Rockefeller in America? Yeah, okay. But what I did learn is that to get a f detailed photograph of that globe, I had to use their photographer. And I think I spent most of my fellowship getting photographs of that particular globe. In any case, <clears throat> I was able to identify the globe. 
Uh, before I leave this painting, I should tell you that this painting still has a very discolored varnish on it. I don't know if any conservator or museum will venture to clean it, but I think the two robes were originally the same color blue. It's probably the same man. There have been efforts to identify the man. Some people say Anthony van Leeuw van Hoek. It could be just a neighbor of Vermeer, we don't know. It's probably someone who is willing to stand for a long time, in any case, or sit for a long time. But um, here we see it close up, <clears throat> and here you can see the globe. I was fortunate to get the photographer to photograph this Hondius globe in the same position. You can make out the constellations there, the Big Bear, for example, or Lyra, uh, etc. And <clears throat> if you look, um, you can see that the globe uh, is surrounded by other instruments, uh, such as the um, uh, astrolabe at the foot of it, and then there's a compass on the table. Let's bring that up in detail. <clears throat> but what may surprise you, and it's only to Vermeer's credit, not to mine, that I was able to identify the book in this painting. Not difficult to do, actually. I came back from a year of research in Holland, and I was waiting for a book at the um, National, um, at the, at the um, uh, um, National Library in, in Washington, D.C., and um, it took some time to get that book. Meanwhile, I said, why don't I go to the card catalog and look to see, because I knew there were books on how to use maps and globes. And you know, card catalogs include the size of the book. And I knew how big that book was, because I, could, I knew how big the globe was. First <clears throat> card I pulled out was this, was this book that you're going to see here. And there it is. Then I learned that there were two editions of it. Oh. And I had to wait till I went back to Holland about a year later to be able to put the two editions together. They weren't in the same library here in America. They were in two different libraries in Leiden, but the, the um, librarian I was working with brought them both to the same room, and we saw them together, and it was great, because there was a change on the page that opened in Vermeer's um, painting. And you can see it. Um, the inscription at the top is, is different. And there's a, the date is 1614 and 1621. Now, lest you doubt me, I'm going to show you it um, here in black and white, where you can see there's an astrolabe there that is quite clear in the... And unfortunately, I don't have the sharpest detail there. But trust me, it's the same um, book. Now, what's in, there you see it in black and white, maybe a little clearer. What's significant <clears throat> about all this is that so much of the cartographic material is out of date when Vermeer is using it. For example, the globe, 1618 both of them, I suspect. Um, the um, the Blau van Birkenrode map, 1621. Um, the, um, the book, uh, about 1621, or 1620 exactly. And these appear in these paintings, and there's their dates. Much, much later, 40 years later. Yeah. So one wonders, is Vermeer, and he is toward the end of the Golden Age, and it does come to an end, like all golden ages, the French become very powerful. Uh, is he reflecting back on this incredible time in Holland about the great age of map making, the great age of everything, almost, in this new Dutch Republic? As a painter who painted the picture that you see on the screen, you can imagine him doing that. But the beauty is, he's painting the everyday world. And that's significant, because genre painting, scenes of everyday life, were the, one of the greatest contributions of the, the Dutch at this time. Well, what about <clears throat> these two paintings? Are they allegories? Well, they could well be. Um, they were um, bought and sold together up until the 18th century. Uh, and um, just like the paintings, the globes exhibit a pendant relationship. Um, terrestrial and celestial globes were published together. And they were expensive. A pair of globes like this, that size, would cost about 32 guilders. That would be about the, a month's salary of a cloth worker in Delft at that time. Okay? Well, are these paintings more than genre scenes? As the great uh, his art historian Horst Gerson said, could they be allegories of the application of the human thought to the problems of the earth and the universe? Certainly the spirit of investigation that's an evident in 
all of Vermeer's paintings in which he uses maps, but certainly in these, um, is captured um, not only in his paintings, but carries over into our own time. So specifically, he captures the wonder and excitement of using cartographic material at this time. <clears throat> there was a contemporary of Vermeer, <clears throat> um, Samuel van Hoogstraten, who said about this same time, and I love it, he said, how beautiful a good map is, wherein you can see the world as from another world, thanks to the art of drawing. And we're doing that today in outer space. This kind of excitement for capturing the world, both in time and spirit, coincides with Vermeer's fascination with specific maps and globes, which certainly has left us one of the richest records of Holland's golden age of Dutch map making. Thank you. <laughs> the question is, could it be that the maps, outdated maps were cheaper and for an artist to have a prop? I, I think you're, that it could well be true. It may be something we never can verify that he's actually trying. For example, um, you saw how you cobbled together that costume of the painter. Well, how, I don't know how accurate he would be with the costumes of going back to the early 17th century, you see. Uh, I want to do more research on that because that is fascinating. And then there's the whole factor that we know that outdated maps were on these walls, <laughs> um, that they were being used for decorative purposes, right? And it's so interesting. If you go into a CEO, CEO's office and he, has a, he or she has a map on the wall, it's probably an old map, right? We love these maps and they probably were starting to love those old maps for the same reason, yeah. Does Vermeer use wall maps more than other artists? I would say yes, in that sense, of a third of his paintings, and there's only about 34 paintings, but you do find them on a lot, in a lot of um, genre paintings. And Vermeer also, and I haven't focused on those, but uses a lot of paintings in his um, uh, interiors. And it's very interesting. Um, the one that used to be at the Gardner Museum that I showed you, the concert, the painting on the back wall there is in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. It was always so nice to, you know, to show our students, if you go to that museum, you can see it in a 17th century painting. And the important point about that is that the painting on the back wall in that musical composition is from the 1620s as well. Yeah, and probably came down through his mother-in-law, who was quite wealthy, who came from the Utrecht, and it's a by a Utrecht painter. So, yeah, there's a lot of things to answer, but you do see, um, for example, in the early 17th century, people like uh, Dirk Hals, who's the brother of better known Franz Hals, used a lot of maps in his paintings, and you will see people looking at them in some of his paintings on the back wall, but never, the map is never as detailed as, as they are in Vermeer's paintings. In fact, Van Megeran, who um, faked Vermeer, as you know, during World War II, uh, he did at least one painting I know of a map, in, and it's clearly not a Vermeer. <laughs> He's just sort of summarily, summarily depicts the cartographic material in the painting. The, the cost of wall maps, would you find them in genre painting? In general, what Vermeer is painting are the upper class, except for like the milkmaid and the, and the lace maker. You do find maps in all kinds of um, shops, uh, like a blacksmith, a shoemaker, textile, not elaborate ones though. It might be just a sheet map tacked to the wall. Um, and we do know that one of the um, people from England who was visiting Holland said that you could find paintings in every kind of shop. They were very affordable in a way. Um, yeah, unlike Vermeer, many artists were paying for the open market. And you know they weren't cheap, but I mean, you could buy them for three or four or five guilders. What we say, um, 32 guilders was the salary of a worker for a month, uh, a textile worker, in it. but you could buy paintings for five and six guilders, so you could have a painting. Um, by the time Vermeer is painting, <clears throat> the, the Dutch are so rich that you could get a client and not have to work for that open market. And the beauty of that is that you could use expensive pigments and you could spend more time. You could edit, you could paint over the map and start over again. Um, the um, for example, if someone paying for the open market would never use those blues, never. In fact, most of the paints were selling very cheaply are really earth colors. Umber, it may look more colorful than it is, but when you look at it, it's mainly brown tones. Yeah. Um, this has been studied many, from many perspectives, Vermeer's 
uh, patronage. Um, it was Michael Montius, the economist um, at Yale University, who did incredible research in the archives uh, in Delft. It was almost an embarrassment to the Dutch because they had scrutinized those archives, but he went in as an economist looking at you know, inventories and all that, and was able to find that 21 of Vermeer's paintings, that's more than half, were in one family in the, in the 18th century. Now we can't verify um, that um, that family commissioned all those. In fact, we can't say that. But it sounds like, um, you know, he was very coveted uh, as far as people loved his work and willing to pay high prices. You know, he, he had a tough life. I mean, he had 11 children. Uh, his wife gave birth to, I think, 16 children or more. But, um, you know, paying the baker's bill was quite a problem. And we know that he was sought after. The famous <clears throat> man from Paris who went to Holland, Monconi, to buy Dutch art, uh, went to The Hague and then went out to Delft to find Vermeer. And he couldn't find Vermeer, but he did see a painting that was owned by the baker. Um, but people were seeking him out. Mm -hmm. But still, his wife, you know, was struggling when he passed away. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate your attention. Thanks. While we do not tend to think of Renoir as an Orientalist uh, in this period of the 1870s, we think of him instead as really a, um, a painter who um, offered us a certain kind of Frenchness um, in his scenes of countryside and cafe concert. 